Hey everybody, welcome back to episode four of season two of Spilling Tea with the G's. Again, I am Nick Galarakis, and with me is my brother Steve Galarakis, two thirds of the G brothers. This episode, we are thrilled to bring our friend from Teen Cancer America, Simon Davies, to you. And don't be alarmed, he has a British accent. It's fantastic, of course. So Steve and I had a great, a great experience sitting there and listening to Simon talk. We know Simon, we go back a few years with him, but we're really excited to bring him on and have him talk about Teen Cancer America and why he does what he does in the AYA cancer community. Right, Steve? Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have him on here. I know a lot of people probably don't know who Simon is because uh, of the work that the special work that Teen Cancer America does, but he truly is a juggernaut in this community and every day is working to better our lives as AYA uh, cancer patients and survivors. And so it's, it was just a really great pleasure to sit down and get to talk to him about why he does what he does and what teen cancer does too. Yeah, for sure. A lot of, they do a lot of behind the scenes type stuff that I don't think everyone sees sometimes. So uh, listen to Simon, listen to us. We're, we're, like we said, pumped to have him, but enough from the two of us. Let's get to the episode. Enjoy. All right, cool. So Simon, thanks again for, for joining Spilling Tea with the G's. Again, I'm Nick and Steve, and um, we're, we're thrilled to have you, man. We've, we've known you for a few years now, right? Yeah, and it's my pleleasure. Um, I got to say, you guys are absolutely killing it with elephants and tea, and you know you're providing some much needed connective tissue at the moment between the uh, in the AYA community, and that's really important, especially especially in these times, uh, these weird times. So uh, you know, it's great to have that communication going. So thank you. Yeah. Oh gosh, thank you so much for the compliment. You know, it's. I, I, I'm going to give my mom credit here for maybe from both of us for the standpoint of when, when we started Elephants and Tea and even when she started up Stephen G, AYA Cancer Research Fund back in the day. And um, her motto to me was always, we have to work with everyone. Like, I don't care how, but we have to, we'll figure it out. So I think that um, we'll give Angie, our mom, some credit for, I think she raised us okay. So I'll, we'll, good. We'll, we'll tip our hat to her. Pretty. How yeah. does that sound, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> So sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. She's so, special. Your mom is special. Yeah. Yeah, she is. She really is. She puts up with us. So you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Well, you're but, special too. I know how much she appreciates you guys. Well, thank you. Thank you, Simon. And so, you know, right off the bat, just to, you know, let, let people know, you know, you, you are the head of Teen Cancer America. And I think it would be great. You know, Steve and I know the awesome work that you do personally, the organization does. But I think it would be great just for the folks listening that may not have heard of Teen Cancer America or aren't, aren't familiar with Teen Cancer America. Can you just kind of let people know what is Teen Cancer America all about? Sure, sure. Actually, do you mind if I do a bit of a history lesson? Because it's quite good to sort of Please. understand where it all came from. And um, people watching now who don't know me will now have discovered that I'm British. And uh, <laughs> so there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a reason for, for that uh, uh, being important because the story for me with young people with cancer began in the UK um, and I was chief executive of the Teenage Cancer Trust which was a charity in the UK that was looking specifically at all of the AYA issues very early on from uh, 1989 in fact I was their chief executive from 2000 to 2013 but really that was the genesis um, of the of my knowledge in this field and I think for many it was the, the it was the pioneer um, as an organization that was developing um, programs and facilities um, in hospitals for adolescents and young adult um, young adults with cancer and bringing together those kind of pediatric and adult silos um, and in the UK it was very successful organization that not only achieved um, those uh, development of those programs in the major hospitals, cancer hospitals throughout the UK, but also created um, with the, um, within the national health system, national standards and measures by which hospitals had to adhere to that. So it was, um, it's a very important sort of component of where Teen Cancer America has come from. Um, and, and, and why we ended up, uh, why, why I ended up here was because um, really the driving force um, in founding Teen Cancer America was Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend of The Who, the, the, 
the legendary rock band and uh, they'd always been supportive of what was happening in the in the UK because they uh, felt indebted to young people it was really their inspiration was that they felt all their success was down to young people they cared about this particular population and they wanted to do more and of course their success in America was as big as it was in the UK so they felt beholden to do something in America as well and that was really how Teen Cancer America got established because principally Roger of the two but both of them but Roger was you know being the lead singer and the guy with the loudest voice you know he was out there saying we got to do something in America and so 2013, well, 2012, the charity was set up and 2013, um, they persuaded me to come over. And really, um, <clears throat> Teen Cancer America operates as a, um, we, we provide a really, I guess, a sort of expert consultancy to hospitals who are interested in developing adolescent and young adult programs. We give them um, both the sort of focus on developing the strategy and the how to do it. It's not a straightforward thing to um, achieve really good collaboration between the paediatric and the adult world. Um, and in some institutions, that's even segre segregated physically um, by, by, by buildings or even distance um, across a city. So we are helping them to, to work out how to do that thing. And we provide them a really expert service right down to doing complete business planning. But then we also give them grants. So if they are, um, if once we know that they've got leadership by and we know that it's got a future in a hospital, we give grants to support those staff um, and, the, uh, and, and we help to, to build facilities that are unique for young people as well that are different from both paediatric and adult environments. Um, so we support that and we, and we help them with the program, programmatic side of it as well um, to deliver key staff that will really help make that happen. And I'm pleased to say that's been, you know, a really, really successful venture. You know, we've got 42 hospital partners now. When I first came, I was kind of cold calling and knocking on doors and asking people to get interested. But generally now, you know, with and, and with the help of, 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 of organizations like Elephants and Tea, which are continually raising the profile, we have a lot more interest in people come to us as opposed to us having to go to them. And we are we have 42 partners, 42 programs that didn't exist before um, that are this uh, combined adolescent and young adult programs. And really, um, I think we're now seeing some exemplary um, uh, systems and some extraordinarily good practice in places that just didn't have it before where young people were isolated in either a pediatric setting or an adult setting and feeling very lonely and out of place and not really having their needs met um, and that's what we do uh, we have a couple of other interesting um, uh, programs that we you know we've been developing we we've, we've got a thriving music education program um, which we got some specific funding for and it's just you know, amazing what we're achieving with many young people putting together their own music and having it produced properly. And that's a really exciting sort of add on to what we do. Uh, we're doing some work around health and nutrition and, and fitness um, with, a, with a company and uh, a national company. So those things are sort of additional, but our core work is we want to change this health structure for adolescents and young adults with cancer. And we're making progress and we want this to be universal in the United States. Very that, cool. Can I get that? Is that okay? I think that's great. I think that should be recorded as your, your, your pitch going forward. No, I, I think that's wonderful. And I remember when Teen Cancer America first came on the scene, you know, for, I think unfortunately, right, so we've been around the AYA world in the U.S. for 15 years now. Um, with with Steve being sick, and obviously Steve, you can speak to that much better than I can. But the you know it, it really has from 15 years to now. I think it's there's such a difference, right, in the AYA space. Yeah. Uh, you guys are a bit of driving force behind that in the hospital setting. I think that that's outstanding the work that you all have done. And it's it's funny, right, where you hear we should mention 42 hospitals, right, you're working yeah. with. Yeah. Um, and and you know it's. This, I don't think people realize how big of a number that really is mm. as far as hospitals. I know there's so many more out there, 
Um, you know, for us, for example, with our magazine, we ship it to 50 plus hospitals. Yeah. Um, you know, and at times you don't, you think, oh, that's like a small number in the sense of numbers, but the amount of people that you really are affecting, it's huge. And I think yeah. there's something to be said for that. Yeah. And one of the benefits, I mean, I think, Steve, you know more than anybody that um, you're uh, really fortunate in Ohio and in Cleveland and in having a program that was already, um, had already come to the UK and learned all they could from us and was developing a really strong program already. And, and you know, you have a, you, you have a program there in, in Cleveland, which is, uh, you know, which is a gold standard. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to see how, see how well that has done. Um, and we've we've certainly used that as a as a model for other people to look at, to investigate, to see, you know, and build that collaboration. We have a little saying here in Cleveland: it's a great place to get sick. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> but no, it's it, it's true. And I was very lucky to have the treatment that I did have, and the doctors and the staff, and that just that overall um, kind of environment, as you spoke of, exactly. it was really wonderful. And the amazing. Fowler family and the Angie Fowler, you know, foundation and the institute that they've created there. Um, it's unique. It's great. It's yeah. great. <clears throat> it definitely is. So, Simon, thank you for kind of giving that land and the now foundation. It's and now it's added elephants and tea. I mean, what is it about Cleveland, the capital, <laughs> capital of America? Come on. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't think we're, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're at the prestige as those two, but thank you. I, I appreciate that. The, so the, that was the, the professional side, right? Teen Cancer America, everything it does. Why, do you, wh why, why cancer for you? Why the teenagers, young adult age group? You know, was yeah. there a certain pull for you back in the UK? Um, and then to continue that in the US, you know, just from a personal standpoint, we're always just curious, you know, why do you do what you do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I've actually been in this, this sort of social and healthcare field since you know as, as long as I can remember I came out of school and and started doing care work in in residential homes for for um actually people with learning disabilities and physical disabilities mm -hmm. and actually that was the early half of my career and the interesting thing about um about uh, my introduction to um adolescent and young adult cancer was really um really fortuitous. I, I mean, I'd like to say, you know, there's some kind of calling that I had, but actually I came to Teenage Cancer Trust in the UK at a time when they were doing really well, but they needed to evolve into an organisation and they needed somebody who knew how to run organisations. And I was there and I was coming and I, and I had been thinking, well, I need a change from what I'd been doing, which is principally working with people with learning disabilities and do something different. And we kind of connected and it took me I mean, a nanosecond to get passionate about this thing, because it's one of those things where um, actually I find the general public get the concept of what we're trying to achieve quicker than the medical profession quite often, because they're stuck in their silos and their ways of working and, you know, and they don't want to change things sometimes. I'm not speaking for everybody. There's great people out there. But, you know, when you actually figure out you know what on earth is happening when young people are being treated with older or younger people and not being addressed for their specific needs you know no other part of society does that they don't do it in schools they don't do it in, in even in the criminal justice system they don't do it you know there, there's a recognition that youth is a is an important period and therefore you know you need to address it specially um, and so it took me no time at all and what I then had to do was to build up an expertise and a knowledge about cancer. Um, but I, what I brought to the organization was like how to grow it and how to make it more effective and how to run it efficiently. So, so that was really my, my, my thing. And, and, but I mean, it became my life's passion um, because, you know, I'm not only am I dedicated to what we're trying to achieve but you, know, you meet so many great young people in this work and they teach you so many things beyond just the you know the work that you're doing but they teach you about life and about you know managing yourself and what they have to go through and you know I, I've really you know they, I've really learned a lot and that's really you know where my passion has, has built built up and 
Um, and then, and then there's really this is a really interesting fun fact. I'm not even sure my team knows this, but um, I, I when I was younger, when I was a, a teen myself, I had a sort of large uh, birthmark. I was a very young teen. I had a large birthmark on my thigh, which my um, which I had removed and I had to have a skin graft and it was taken away. And it was only when I had worked for, for Teen Cancer America, sorry, for Teenage Cancer Trust for a couple of years that I, I thought about that and I thought, well, what was all that about, you know? And mm. I asked my mum about it and she said, oh, it's because they actually thought you've got a cancer. And, um, and, and that this, and it was going cancer, cancerous and, and they needed to remove it. And I thought, well, hey, hang on a minute. So that means I was a teen with cancer, which I never realised because nobody ever used the word. Typical scenario, you know, they didn't use the word. They didn't tell me what was going on. I was just, you know, and I, I was, you know, treated in an adult hospital, which I hated because there was old people there. I mean, I was, a, I mean, I was only in hospital for a couple of weeks and it was, a, it, you know, I, I had to have it redone later, but it was all okay. And there wasn't, you know, I didn't have to go through any kind of chemotherapy or any of the kind of, uh, rough stuff that you've had to deal with Stephen but you know on reflection I thought hang on a minute maybe there's something in there you know that uh, connected um, that uh, it seems a coincidence that uh, I yeah. was a team with cancer and I didn't know it. <laughs> That's fascinating yeah who knows like the, the subliminal you know the conscious just yeah. had you tied back to it somehow. Yeah for me I just went into hospital and I had a nasty scar on my leg you know that I had to deal with which was you know, which I hated, you know, but I didn't know why it was removed and then nobody ever used that term. And I never wow. thought about it again until I started working with the charity. Wow, that's pretty neat. Isn't it? Uh, Steve, do you have something? I'm sorry. Well, yeah, so uh, Simon, you, you've obviously been working with, as you said, the medical population for, you know, a yeah. very long time and you've been working with youth for a long time. And you said, you know, the general population understands <laughs> the need for this faster and, and, and better than the medical professionals do. So I guess the question I have for you is, why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because, um, as I said, the pediatric and the adult worlds have, have, have grown up in silos. Um, and, and, and to some extent, rightly so. I mean, pediatrics had to carve out its place in the health system. Once upon a time, there wasn't pediatrics. Everybody was lumped in together. And then in the whatever it was, 1940s or whatever, they really started to build up. Um, you know, a pediatric professions. And so, and so then those things start to become institutional, you know, and then when you look at the structures, um, the pediatric is a very holistic structure um, and the adult structure is, is very um, uh, tumor type, cancer type driven, you know, as everybody's in their specialist area. And so they've grown in that way. And then, um, what you're asking people to do sometimes is get out of their comfort zone and, and, and work differently. And of course, it's so important in this population where you get pediatric cancers appearing in the adult world and, and adult clinicians scratching their heads and thinking, what are we gonna do with this? And, and you get early onset adult cancers appearing in the pediatric world and that's challenging for those, uh, those pedi <coughs> pediatric oncologists. So, um, it's just that we're, uh, we are asking people to sort of change structures and systems and ways of working, and that's always uncomfortable. It's like a sort of uncomfortable business merger in a way, you know, that, and, it's, and, and getting people to sort of recognise that change is needed and, and will be beneficial is, is hard to do. Whereas if you just say to the general public, well, imagine you're a teen and, and, and you go into a hospital, you're, you're a six foot, 14 year old and you go into hospital and the bed's too short for you that's crazy you know how can that be you know or you're in an adult uh, you're going for your chemo and the only people in the chairs around you um are in their 60s you know what's that like people can get that and understand it really quickly but asking structures and systems and people to change is is, is challenging and they need help it's not it's not an easy thing to do it is, actually isn't no. an easy thing to do and we we're there to help them and of course, you know, I'm 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 not kind of trying to be too down on the on on the uh, people on the front line. They do amazing work and they're and they're great. And I'm not and I don't want to be to generalise. I'm just saying that it is a difficult thing to do, and that's where we kind of 
oil those wheels and help people develop the strategies and the direction to achieve it. Well, and I think, and just to add to that, and then we can, we could probably move on from that topic because I agree we don't want to sit here and bash to anyone necessarily, any or individually. And we're not, so there, we're not bashing is, anybody. No, yeah, not, and again, not saying you were. I'm just saying though, and just in general, I think that there's so many doctors that their one focus is the cancer, right? And they don't, which I, I understand. Like they went to school for treating this, but they might not be treating the mind. They might not be doing other things from a psychosocial standpoint. Yeah. Um, whether that's from training or whatever the case may be. And as we all know, the three of us know, the AYA age range has just such a different set of psychosocial issues, just as one yeah. example. You know, yeah. the, the, the bed thing, I think Steve could talk about more than anything when he went back for a second cancer, he was 18 at six feet tall. But, you know, and just, the, but there's, there's, there's other things there, just seeing what Steve went through with his doctors, um, you know, the, the past time around they're so focused on the cancer, they're not focused on anything else, where when you are in an AYA pod, um, they seem to be focused about everything. And even the family they're focused on too, right? And I yeah. think that, that that's that's a huge component of it. Yeah, as well. yeah. And I want to just say as well that one of the things that I love about the working in the AYA health community is when you most of the professionals that I, I have met who are really engaged with the AYA community are wonderful people who are really wanting to, to, to do something different and make a difference. And I, and I love that. I think, I think we're very fortunate, um, and we see this in the advocacy world, that so many of the health professionals that are working with are so very keen to engage in our community and understand it. And when they do get it, they're as, they're, they're as good an advocates as, as any of us. And that's what's exciting to see. And you'll know that, Steve, from the team, you know, and the people that work at, uh, um, at Cleveland. So it's really, um, you know, it's a, it's a good community. You know, there's a lot of, the, there's a good balance between advocacy um, and the health community, I think, in, the, in this field. Simon, who was the first hospital that Teen Cancer America worked with? So we were certainly um, involved with uh, 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 Rainbow Babies in Cleveland um, in the early days as they were, they were already developing um, programs and facilities there. And I'd, I'd actually helped them from the UK even before Team Cancer America existed. Um, they'd been out there to come and see me and I'd been advising them by phone. Um, UCLA was the first uh, facility sort of program that we uh, built, which was really a, a, tip, a, a classic kind of um, Roger Daltrey maneuver. He, he pinned the uh, chief executive of UCLA down at a, at a, at a fundraiser <laughs> and, and convinced him in, in his own inimitable, in that inimitable style that, you know, this is something that UCLA really needed to do. And they took it on. So, you know, that was great. Um, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering was a very early one. And the work that Rebecca Johnson did at Seattle, Seattle Children's, um, even uh, as, as we were coming on board, she was already involved in that. That was, a, um, that was also around the same time. So 212, 213 was, was that. But uh, having said that, I want to just say that there are, there are institutions that I've met who've kind of like have taken this on even before Teen Cancer America existed. It might not be in the same structured way, um, but there, were, there was genuine interest out there because of things like, you know, the, the, the Livestrong and the uh, adult um, uh, the AYA alliance that existed, you know, people out there wanting to do stuff. So um, I don't want to say, you know, it was a desert before Teen Cancer <laughs> arrived. We might have done a lot since then and, and actually helped to, to really build some good structured programs. Um, but there was good people and good stuff going on. Um, beforehand cool what is your elephant in the room simon when it comes to cancer we like to throw this question out at all of our all of our guests um you know um i want to have more than one elephant you can have a herd we, yeah. we tell people you can have herds that's fine <laughs> so um I think uh, the fact, I, I, th I, I think the, the, the structures are really challenging. Uh, they're, they're challenging the world over, but they're, they're, the structures are really 
challenging and to be overcome. And I, I know we're working on that, but everyone is an elephant. You know, every every health system is idiosyncratic and how to how to find the way through to make that structure. I think that's um, uh, that is uh, an elephant in the room. Um, and then I think, you know, occasionally I have to say that, uh, that, that, that you can get, I guess, the sort of people, <laughs> people can be the elephant in the room, um, you know, in that the people that really don't want to change and, and, and try and obstruct progress. And, and actually, I often, I often spend my time trying to spend more time with those people because I think it's just about where they've come from and where they're at. It's not that they're cruel and unfeeling people, but they, you know, they have a way of working and they don't want that disrupted. And, and that's, that's a, a lesser elephant, but still one to overcome. So those, those, those are, the, are the real challenges. I mean, you know, there are other things, you know, we need more money, we need more investment, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we need to, you know, we need to see more, um, you know, research and clinical trials in this area. You know, um, uh, there's a lot of areas that need improvement. Um, but um, I think once you've, I do believe that, and, and again, we can use Cleveland as an example, once you get a structure and a health system that's, that's made changes, so many other things flower from that. You know, that's the seed. You get the foundation of that right. And then suddenly you've got, you know, more people interested in research than they ever were before because they've started to look at the population differently. And so you get a research arm. You know, more people start to understand the challenges. So they start to look at professional education. Um, they understand that, you know, suddenly they've got a group of young people that come together, you know, who hunt in packs and, they, and, and their voice becomes stronger. So, you know, you've got to listen to them and there's more advocacy, you know. So it's, uh, it's, it's how, you know, once you, once you kind of get over that hill, of, the, of changing the structure, then you get this kind of flowering, you know, like the like the the rainbow baby's roof garden. You know, it's a it's a beautiful beautiful place to be, um, and you get more and more things happening, and and then it becomes just a way of life. It just becomes then then that's when you that's when we feel then we can backpedal because it becomes the norm, you know. Right. So is that does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> I would say yes. I, I think yeah. those are several elephants. Go ahead, Steve. I could tell you're ready to like jump in on this one. Well, it was more about what you said there with the blossoming of uh, institutions as things are developed. And one of, you know, I know my big hopes for the future and my brother slightly is looking at, you know, AYA, but not necessarily the cancer community, but AYAs as a whole, as a population. So have you seen anything blossoming in the direction of regular young adult health care in these hospitals or is it still kind of you know stuck in not stuck but in the cancer community where it's still being developed uh, no, um yeah yes I, I have and I, and that's uh, and it's encouraging and and what we saw um in the time at the uh, in, in the uk and the us was other other patient groups um and other other health professionals taking a look at what was happening and saying hang on a minute you know, we're dealing with cystic fibrosis patients, you know, who span this age group. Um, and, 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 you know, why can't they have something set, uh, special? You know, congenital heart disease, you know, you see that in, in that area as well. And people take an interest in what and why not. And, um, and, and I also saw, you know, some hospitals who decided to develop like youth policies across the whole of the organization. So they would have like a sort of adolescent and, and, and young adult policy for the whole hospital. Um, because, and, and, and actually, when you think about it, um, I'm a great believer in the specialism of cancer and, and, you know, it has very special needs. But if you think about the economies of scale, take, for example, psychological support um, from trained psychologists, no reason why they can't work with young people with cancer and young people with other diseases. So hospitals can actually make their systems work across for more, for more youth. And actually um, Roger Daltrey um, has, has recently been talking to me about the idea of, you know, could we find anywhere um, and could we find support 
for developing an, an adolescent and young adult wing of a hospital that has, you know, has within it, you know, cancer, cystic fibrosis, whatever other disease areas that need to, but actually have something so that, um, so that for the young people going there, it's a total experience, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the, 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 uh, they get their specialist support and care, but they also can dip into the, the potential engagement to work to, to with other, you know, people, young people with other diseases or, or, um, and, then, and learn from their experiences and some of the cross fertilization that I think is going to happen with um, with things like the, the um, uh, development of um, genetic medicine and things like that. I think we're going to find um, going forward and they already are in this in certain areas treatments that will be applicable to more than one disease. It, that actually, you know, and immuno immunology and things. I think we, we'll, I think that will, that's something that I feel is going to emerge in the future. That they're going to find something that, you know, if you crack that, it's going to help something else. Um, you know, and and that will be a really interesting, you know, new field of science. Mm. That's well, awesome. that's uh, interesting. You say that because I know that the uh, National Institute of Health, they are here here in the U.S. is documenting all of the pediatric cancers that, are, that exist in the country and trying to create a genetic field map to that. So instead of saying it's a testicular cancer, it's a certain mutation and trying to focus them based on those genetic mutations. So right. it'd be interesting to see what comes out of that research and those studies. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and the landscape may change, you know. So um, it's, uh, yeah, these are for sure interesting times. And I think what, what I love about that idea of the wing for, for AYAs, regardless of cancer or other diseases, the, just the, like the, the psychiatrists, the ancillary type support systems yeah. that can all just focus on one floor, I think is so huge, yeah. uh, you know, and because that, that age group, I find there are organizations that focus on specific cancers, but as you know, with elephants and tea and even teen cancer America and others, doesn't matter what type of cancer that person has, they're all going through the same issues. Yeah. Obviously there are certain things that are specific to those cancers, yeah. but for the most part, the financial stuff, the psychosocial stuff, the relationships, fertility, all those things are bundled into the same group of people and how cool that would be for a, an institution, a hospital to have everyone within the same unit, if you will, yeah. where people can focus on. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Well, it, Pretty cool, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Simon. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it reminds me as well of um, when you get into um, uh, the, the cancer world, I've, I've spoken to a lot of young people, and this is something that I think is relevant in survivorship, is that I've spoken to a lot of young people who talk about when they come out of that, you know, end of treatment, it's like falling off a cliff. You know, it's like there's a chasm. And, and actually, um, I think quite often because people are so enshrined within this cancer world, then finding the things outside it that can be helpful and supportive is actually a difficult roadmap to then, to, to, to then engage with. And actually, when you look at what a lot of communities have in terms of community supports and stuff like that, they're not specific to cancer, but people don't get referred into those because everybody says, you know, come back to a cancer hospital or find a specialist cancer organization. And I'm not, decrying any of those great support organizations there are but sometimes look outside there might be something else that's not necessarily you know in this world of cancer you know that you never leave <laughs> you know mm -hmm. you might find other stuff that's really relevant to you and perhaps it's quite a relief to be you know associating with support systems that are not just focusing on, on cancer so it's um yeah it's a it's a it's a challenge it does great things because it brings you all that expertise but when you leave it it's like as scary as getting cancer in the first place because you're having to go back i mean steve you, you know what i'm talking about am i making sense here? oh no no you're you're not making it up at all i mean i know you know as a someone who has been diagnosed at multiple stages in his life yeah. now you know uh after my first two cancers being 19 years old it was like falling off a cliff because honestly not say cancer is easy because it's not, but cancer was the easy part. All I had to do was stay alive. And then afterwards yeah. you have to thrive yeah. in life and do things and you don't know where to look. And it's just, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, 
And that's, I mean, you were talking about, you know, with this wing, the idea of the wing at a hospital. One thing I've discovered over the last 15 years is that life is perspective, but trauma is ubiquitous among people, especially young, among, uh, among young people. And I think, you know, uh, I think everybody who has gone through a trauma, whether it's cancer or some other type of event, once that immediate acute help is over, you're kind of left to the wilderness of life. And I think having a place where everyone could go just to commiserate would be a yeah. wonderful thing, let alone having all those resources yeah. in a place because you do really feel like you fall off a cliff and, you're, and the world is not built for you. Exactly. And, and you've, you've lost all those personal connections or they've become strained that you had when you went into this world because all those people have moved on and especially again at this age group you know all your friends have gone they're traveling the world or they're going to university you know or they've got jobs or their wives and and, and you know they're, they're you know they're, they're married or they've got relationships and they you know and suddenly you're kind of kind of finding your way back into what essentially is a is is a new world um and um that's not easy um and and yet you know you're kind of like giving a pat on the back and hey you know, you're, 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 um, you know, we'll see you in six months <laughs> and that's it. You know, or feel, you can feel like that, you know, and that's why I think, you know, um, I love the specialism of cancer, but I think cancer has to look outward. The, 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 the health community has to look outward to what that really means uh, for long-term support. And it's not all about coming back to the hospital. It's actually about, it's kind of like kids leaving home. You know, you've got to, You've got to gear them up in order that they can take advantage of what's out of there, out there, you know, and, and not be reliant on this, uh, you know, on the cancer kind of spaceship that they've been living on for the past two, you know, two, four years or whatever it is. Um, and fam and that goes for families. I mean, right. you know, Nick, you know, you've been, you know, you lived, I bet you've, I bet you've spent an awful lot of time in hospital in your, in, in the time that you've been, right. um, you know, and not doing other stuff because, you know, you've been there for Steve. Right. Our whole family. Right. And we always, you know, Steve and I joke around that there is a third G brother that's just not as involved yeah. and, you know, but, you know, Phil lived at home when Steve was going through his treatments. Yeah. Um, first, first, two, no, first one. Um, and which was by far, I think, most intense. Um, well, debatable. The second one was pretty intense. Um, but again, you know, like you said, Simon, it's like I was able to go to college uh, when Steve was sick the first time. So I could break away. We always talk about that, how my brother Phil, he was home. So, yes, we were in the hospital a lot. But there's the other side of it, too, right, where you're you're, you're pulled in. The family's there, um, you know. So, yeah, everyone's everyone's pulled in. Everyone's pulled in. Yeah, and, and that brings, you know, that those scenarios just bring their own challenges as well, because, you know, you're at college, but you feel bad because Steve is going through what he's going through. You know, you've got a life and, you know, um, I, I always remember two, um, two twins, uh, a, a, a twin pairing of one got cancer and one didn't, uh, mm. uh, one, and they were both 16. Um, and um, they talked about sort of untwinning because you know they'd always grown up as twins but then they had to find a new life of being and and the and the, the twin that wasn't that didn't have um cancer went crazy i mean he went off you know he, he went off the rails you know he, he you know he, he started drinking too much and you know and and just having a mad lifestyle and and when he spoke about it he was reflecting on actually that was kind of his way of coping that you know his parents had spent 16, 17 years treating them both exactly the same, exactly the same. And then suddenly, you know, they had to treat one completely differently. And the other one had to find his own way in that, in that scenario. And, and not only was he doing mad things, but he felt really bad about it all the time <laughs> because, because he knew that this was, uh, you know, that he wasn't doing what a good twin should do. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, the dynamics are complex, you know, and then there's Stephen, who's in hospital thinking, God, my whole family is having to, um, you know, reorganize their lives around me and the responsibility you feel for that. And again, at this age, I'm going to, I'm, I'm on a bit of a soapbox here, you've got to get bear with me. <laughs> but at this age, you know, this is at a time when young people understand what is happening to them in a way that little children don't, don't um, and they don't, but yet they don't have the maturity 
necessarily to deal with that, with what that means um, to to um, you know that they would if they were much older. And so this kind of kind of middle time. Um, and I was talking to um, a young person just recently who said that she never shared with her parents the pain that she went through. Um, she had osteosarcoma and had a uh, had, had um, a surgery and all the rest of it. She never shared with her parents because because she was at an age where she knew the impact of what her cancer was doing to her parents. I bet this is echoing with you, Steve. You know what you you know how how heavy that is for those people, and you try and your natural thing is to try and protect them from that. So you don't necessarily share that you you know. Uh, how depressed you might be or how you know challenging it is for you because you know that all that does is to distress them so you're taking a big responsibility at a vulnerable age and um you know it's why the specialist you know help for this age group is so important and you know young adults the same i don't i don't mean just to focus on teens i mean it's it's equal i think with young adults as well oh most definitely i mean i know from friends who are, who are, who were diagnosed as adults who do the same thing. And for me, when I was younger, I did it with my father Yeah, because he was by far the more openly emotional of the, of my two parents. Not that my mom wasn't emotional because they both were, but he was the one who was really appeared to be the most affected by what I would say and how I would feel. So yeah. he definitely got about 60% of the information where my mom got 95% of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And those, those dynamics are just real and they're, they're normal and people need to know that they're normal as well. That's why I think the specialist help of uh, working with this age group comes where people who are experienced in this can, can help you with that, you know, and help and, and help. And, and it's difficult for somebody who's spent most of their life working with, with you know, um, you know, naught to 10 year olds, you know, to kind of deal with this kind of strange 16 year old who's you know doesn't take their meds when they should do and wants to go out drinking at night you know and likewise in the adult world they're used to dealing with much more mature people and suddenly they're having to deal with somebody who doesn't speak to them <laughs> you know or, or, or you know or if they don't like them they'll tell them uh, you know it's it's, it's uh, yeah yeah and and you've got to roll with it you know and that's why i think when people do start working in the in the field, I've had many professionals who come back to me after they've been developing and working in the program who said, I never realized, <laughs> you know, I never realized what I, I didn't know. I did, there was stuff that I just didn't know I didn't know. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's, uh, it, it's changed completely how I, you know, how I see things for people of this age group. Definitely, that's so true. It's so true. I always like, I love that saying, you don't know what you don't know. And I think- yeah. you, you hit that on the head there for sure. So, well, Simon, it's been a pleasure, my friend, having yeah. you with us. Um, you know, we're chewing the fat with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Can't can't wait to uh, hopefully see each other in person one, one more yeah. time at some point, right? My gosh, that I mean it was I was supposed to see you right when everything hit the fan. Um, it was that second week of March, and it just didn't happen. So soon Ho hopefully this spring summer hopefully something right we'll see but uh, yeah, yeah we'll see i think we're i mean uh, sadly i think we're in for a tough winter so we just have to you guys got to stay safe yes stay safe. Well. definitely keep wearing the mask keep the social distance do the right things yeah do as well my friend well thank you again so well, much for it's a pleasure us. it's a pleasure yeah. thank right. you simon take care right. bye